My favorite story as a child was called The Hideous Hair. Of course, it went by other names depending on who was telling it, uh, and what kind of mood they were in. My father never liked that name. When we were snuggled in bed, he sat by our nightstand with his fingers running over the grooves on the dollar store lamp. He called it the hag in the hair. If he felt especially adventurous, he'd replace hag with a word we weren't allowed to say. There's the scrawny little ten-somethings that we were. The story in question was a well-loved one, passed down from our thrice great-grandmother to her son, and from there to her daughter and so on. All the way to our father. The lesson was simple enough to grasp, but it wasn't one learned by the glass slipper fitting on the princess's foot, or the frog shedding his slimy skin for that of a prince. Once upon a time, my father would say in a hushed tone as if he was telling us a secret tale that was only for Jacob's and my little ears. There was an old hag who lived in a tiny house in the middle of nowhere. The hag in question did live in the middle of nowhere, and behind her house was a vegetable garden. Rabbits would come and steal bites from her carrots and lettuce. She didn't like it, not one bit. She hated rabbits. So when fall raked the last of the trees bare, and the winter's cold fingers crept up ever so slowly, she sat in a rocking chair, reading how to get rid of the little bastards. And that's when she heard the very first knock. It wasn't an ordinary knock, mind you. It was a thump knock. She knew it must have been an animal at her door. When she moved to the door and threw it open, there stood a hare. It was white as the driven snow, but was by no means perfect. It bore mangled ears and an empty, bloodied socket where an eye used to be. The poor creature had seen some hardship, that was for sure, but of course the old woman had no sympathy. Miss, if you might spare some warmth for the night, I would be forever in your debt. My warren has flooded with the autumn rain. My father would always pitch his voice up an octave and soften his eyes when voicing the rabbit. The hag's voice was always low, snapping tone like dry twigs in a fire. For a moment, the hag laughed. It was the laugh of a mean old bitch, the kind that made you think of ruby slippers and gingerbread houses. You think I'm going to let a silly old rabbit stay the night in my house? That's a gag, a gag indeed. You better get off my porch or I'll get my gun and spatter your freaky little face all over it. The hare, terrified for its little life, bounded away into the thicket. The next evening was colder still. The thump knocking came again as the hag was embroidering a small fox into the middle of a flower ring. She loved foxes. Foxes eat rabbits. Of course, they also eat chickens. All of hers had disappeared several winters ago under mysterious circumstances. She stood and threw open the door yet again. She met the chilling air with disgust, just as she did the rabbit's renewed pleading. Miss, surely you can spare me a night's shelter. My body's so weak. I don't think I can stand another night in the cold. In this cold, hungry forest. I'll repay you however I'm able. There was no laugh from her lips this time. She only stared down at the bastard bunny. You'd do better in the forest than you will if you keep tottering around my doorstep. Get gone, you hideous hare. With that, she made for the broom closet before it could feel the bite of straw and scampered away into the thicket once more. The next evening, the first snow of winter had just begun to grace the ground. The hag sat by a roaring fire with a pot of tea and a small platter of cheese and bread. When the thump knocking came from the third and final time, She stormed over to the door and wrenched it open. She could barely contain her fury as the rabbit pleaded. Please, miss, the snow has come and I'll freeze to the very death. One night out of the cold is all I ask, no more. She stomped her foot, barely missing its paw. At this point in the story, my dad would jump to his feet and stomp his foot onto the ground, spooking us without fail. Then freeze! If I see you on my doorstep again, I'll skin you good, you wretched little thing. With that, she slammed the door, nearly crushing the poor hare in the process. The rabbit began to squeak with desperation. She snatched the cheese knife from the small end table and made for the door. The hare opened its mouth to speak, but the hag gave it no time. She angrily stepped out to snatch it up and skin it into a nice fur hat. 
but she missed. It gaily ran inside, slamming the door behind her. Let me in! Let me in! She cried as she heard the lock click into place. You'd better get off my porch, or I'll skin you to a bloody pulp! The rabbit sneered. After banging for several minutes, and a string of curses that would make the devil blush, she realized she was not getting back in and walked uncertainly into the night to beg for shelter, just as the hare had done. Sitting on the old oak steps of the front porch, I remember wondering if my dad would tell us that story that evening. He wasn't up for telling stories much nowadays. Now all we heard was his soft grieving from down the hall. That and the fire and brimstone and the word of God from our aunt. There were many things our father wasn't up for anymore. Holding a job. Feeding us. Clothing us. Caring for us when we were sick. That duty fell on my aunt at her insistence. I read the passage over and over, absorbing almost none of it. My thoughts, scattered as they were, were interrupted by the crows of my aunt's rooster. I closed the Bible, placing it to the side, and watched the snow gently fall. Snow was an odd sight in November around these parts, but the weatherman on the old fuzzy TV had said a cold front was coming from the northwest. The corn stalks swayed in the gentle breeze, and amidst it all sat the scarecrow. It was no ordinary scarecrow. It didn't know who made it, but it bore the face of a malnourished rabbit, a ridge above where each eye would have been cast deep shadows on its face, and its burlap skin was pulled tight, giving it a gaunt face to match its tattered ears. The body was painfully low effort compared to the face, consisting of only two tree branches and a burlap bag stuffed with hay, all tied to a post. As the snow continued to fall, it dusted its limbs gently and white. My childish brain was stuck with the notion that the scarecrow might be cold. I stood then, walking back into the house. My steps were light as I crept to the front closet. In the time I'd been living in that old farmhouse, I knew that the less noise I made, the less my existence mattered. Generally, one would view that as a negative thing, but to me, it meant avoiding confrontation. I wasn't so lucky that night, though. It couldn't always be avoided. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? My aunt snapped as I reached for the spare winter coat in the closet. The smell of sap clung to her skin and stained her fingers like blood. I considered myself lucky she did not still hold the axe. I was so caught off guard that I gave her my honest answer. I'm getting a coat for the scarecrow. It's cold. She let out a mirthless laugh. It was her way of saying, no the hell you aren't, without wasting her words. She slammed the closet door shut, nearly catching my fingers. I jumped. Where's the Bible I gave you? I realized a moment before the back of her firm bony hand hit the back of my head that it was still sitting outside on the porch. Go get that damn Bible! You should be ashamed, leaving the good book out in the elements like that? Rotten. So like the rotten child I was, I immediately ran back outside to retrieve the Bible. The snow was falling thicker now. The graceful flakes mashed into blustery gray. The air tasted like dirty ice and pine. I pulled my jacket tighter around me as I clutched the Bible. The scarecrow was still sitting at its diligent watch. For a moment, I imagined it shivering in the cold. And that's when I made up my mind. The yellow grass crackled under my feet. It was the kind that stayed perpetually crunchy, even in the lushest of springs. Hello, I said meekly as I came to stop right in front of it. I thought you might like a little company. The hair crow gave no reply. I found myself relieved that it had not spoken back, as if that was a reasonable thing to fear in the first place. You look lonely and cold. So I, I came to give you this. I shrugged the jacket from my shoulders and stood on my tiptoes to affix it to his branchy ones. The breeze that swayed the cornstalk slowly died. 
The quiet was serene until it went on for too long. I felt the cold fingers of observance creep up my back. Something was watching me. How can you watch the fields if you don't have any eyes? I asked, mostly to break the silence. Here, let me fix that for you. Everyone deserves to see, especially you. You have such a nice view of the sunset. I took out the permanent marker I left in my overall pocket from when Aunt Rachel had made me copy Bible verses earlier after I couldn't find her misplaced axe. I was nearly unable to reach, but I managed to give it the best rabbit-looking eyes I could. We stood there for a moment, observing each other. Finally, I turned back. I'll see you again soon. I tossed over my shoulder as I began to brisk walk back to the warmth of the house. My aunt was mercifully drooling in her rocking chair, some late-night program droning on behind her snores. My father was awake in his room, even though I, I couldn't hear his voice. His grief was loud enough. I sat the Bible down on the china cabinet. My shoulders hadn't stopped shaking, and I blew into my red hands trying to bring the feeling back to them. You really are one of a kind. The scent of cocoa rise from the pot that Jacob was stirring, warm and inviting. He was the one lucky enough to be able to use the stove out of the two of us. I watched you out of the window, you know. My shoulders relaxed. They'd been tense since meeting the scarecrow, for no particular reason. It had been only Jacob's eyes on me. I don't know why you get so close to that scarecrow, much less give it your jacket. That thing freaks me out, he confessed, as he poured the steaming chocolate into two silver mugs. I sighed. Nobody deserves to be alone, was all I could say. He rubbed his thumb over his bottom lip for a few moments, something he did when he was lost in thought. And then he smiled. Fair enough. But you better not go asking me for any of my clothes when yours are on that rabbit out there. You'll be running around yelling, my shoes, my shoes, the rabbit took my shoes. But you'll just have to be barefoot as that scarecrow tap dances all the way to New York City in your little Chuck Taylors. We both howled with laughter at this, until we nearly woke my aunt. Once we drained our mugs and our bodies had returned to its normal temperature, we moved up the creaking old stair to our bedroom. Worn white sheets swallowed us whole, and we both fell into a comfortable silence. There was no bedtime story from our father that night. Just as the first rays of sun were creeping over the windowsill, and the rats in the walls were beginning to quiet, our Aunt Rachel woke us up for school with little more than a, Breakfast is downstairs, don't be late. She was a brash woman. Someone called her behavior abusive, and they'd be right. But in those days... It was all filed under the all-too-broad label of strict. Still, she did the bare minimum of keeping us alive and healthy. As I walked out onto the porch where the thin layers of snow from the night before had begun to melt, I saw my jacket. Jacob dragged behind me, and I wondered if it was him who'd retrieved the jacket and left it there on the porch so our aunt wouldn't turn my backside inside out. I just shrugged and I put it on. Jacob met me at the bottom step with our school bags, and off we went. It wasn't a long walk to and from school. The town had one bus and one route. It didn't end up in our neck of the woods for one reason or another. Though school was a safe haven, I hadn't made many friends there. Today would be the day that changed that. That day was the day where the teacher stood at the front of the class with a girl clutching the black strap of her Lisa Frank backpack and introduced... Naomi to the class. When I met the girl who showed me her favorite books amongst the middle school library shelves, when I met the girl who held my hand in the hallway and gave me a quick, innocent kiss behind the tunnel in the rickety playground, that day changed my life forever. I skipped down the dirt road home. Jacob tried his best to keep up with me. The breath of honeysuckle flowers in the air felt sweeter that afternoon. What's got you about to fly away? Jeez, you're like a kite. For the first time since getting to school that morning, I felt a note of hesitation. I mean, sometimes I wondered what would have happened if I had kept a secret. So I hadn't found validation in Jacob. I scanned around and then whispered as if the very trees and dirt had eyes and ears. I kissed a girl today, Jake. 
as Devis feel about how it was wrong, like some part of me expected, and ooh rose from his mouth. The kind of jeering that fills classrooms when somebody gets called to the principal's office. Pandora has a crush on somebody? Is it the new girl? We spent the last leg of our journey home lightheartedly bickering back and forth as siblings tend to do. It was only when the house came into view that Jacob grabbed my arm and stopped me. There was a deep sadness in his voice. Pandora, listen to me. This is important. Whatever you do, you cannot tell Aunt Rachel about this. Okay, she... She won't like it. <laughs> I want you to keep it a secret between us for now, okay? At that time, it didn't click in my mind why he'd said that. The bruises of Jacob's arms and legs, the cries of unclean for my aunt, and the sad look he often had in his eyes in that year that we lived with her never truly hit me until the day it did. We got inside and were immediately put to work on the back garden. The afternoon moved slower than a slug in molasses until Aunt Rachel sent us to bed after a meal of watery chicken stew and two hot baths. My muscles ached as I pulled open our window. I paused, listening for Jacob's slow and even breathing. And when he didn't stir, I climbed out onto the front porch roof. I slid down the wooden support and turned my eyes out to the field. There sat the scarecrow. The half-moon hung low in the sky above it, a yellow and slightly sour lemon wedge. I walked up to him as if approaching an old friend. Um, Mr. Harecrow? No, that's not right. You need a name. Everybody needs a name. How about... Frith? The name had worked its way out of the corners of my mind. From when I lifted Watership down from the high school-only section of the library... It fit in a way that I knew nothing else would. The wind made the cornstalks sway. Almost in approval. I smiled. I love names. Especially Naomi. I love the name Naomi. I imagine the scarecrow was giving me a knowing look. Okay, I know. I know. I'll tell you what happened. So just like with my brother, I relayed my secret in a quiet tone, as if I was telling it the directions to some treasure deep in a swamp. Frith, for his part, listened patiently and quietly. I talked with him until the first hints of the sun lightened the sky. Once I realized that dawn was fast approaching, I scrambled back into the roof and into my bed. I thought you'd gone and gotten yourself killed. I heard him before I saw him. Jacob was sitting up with his eyes weak from sleep. Then I went and looked out of the window. Why do you like that scarecrow so much? It gives me the creeps. I sighed. And I began to change out of my pajamas and into school clothes. I hadn't shut my eyes the entire night. School would be exhausting today, even if it was better than here. He looks lonely. Nobody deserves to be alone. And I know I'm the only one who's brave enough to go spend time with him. I paused to pull on my shoes before adding, No offense, Jacob. He pulled himself out of bed. The cycle of school, chores, homework, bed started all over again. Whatever free time I had was spent with my brother, my nose and whatever books I could hide from my aunt, or, or talking with my quiet friend Frith. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months turned into nearly a year. My aunt only got worse in her treatment of us. The night that we were sent to bed without supper and the pages of Bible verses we had written gradually grew in number. We saw very little of our father during that time. Only the ghosts of his footprints moving to and from the kitchen or bathroom at odd hours of the night and the whispers of weeping for our mother and his wife. I never blamed him for turning a blind eye to our abuse. And I still don't. He was at the bottom of an inescapable ocean. That's why when he walked in on the night of Halloween, after we'd been sent to bed without supper yet again, Jacob and I were shocked to see him appear in our doorway. He looked fragile in the purest sense of the word. His perpetual sore eyes crisscrossed with red veins. 
He'd eaten very little food in the months since we'd gotten here, and his figure reflected that. He was more rake than man. He ran a hand through his matted orange hair and sucked in a breath through chapped lips. I held in my tears at the sight of him. You kiddos have time for a bedtime story? I saw the renewed joy in his eyes when our faces lit up. I think we can fit you into our schedule, Jacob said in a breathless, happy voice. He sat down on the end of my bed as Jacob flew across the room to us. Our father started a tale about a little girl living high in a tower, but I stopped him. Dad, you should tell us something scary. It's Halloween after all. He rubbed his scruffy chin as he considered my request. You two are awfully young for that sort of thing, aren't you? I laughed a little. Dad, I'm 13. For a moment, his eyes filled with sorrow. I knew now what that look meant. He was one of a man watching the lives of his kids slip by him, knowing that he wasn't present for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you're right. After several long moments of deep thought, our father began to weave a tale about two little girls wandering in the forest on Halloween to find a magic well, only to find out it was haunted. It wasn't his best, but it kept us gripped until the very end. When the story concluded, he stood up and rubbed his face. I love you both so much. Don't ever forget that. He reached out a hand and offered us both a small brownie in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern. Our aunt didn't believe in Halloween, so there was no hoard of treats for us to be had. Jacob and I eagerly took the treats, and our dad smiled as we filled our stomachs with sweet chocolate goodness. He got to his feet and wiped at his perpetually weepy eyes. I'll be around more for you two now, I promise. I can't say for certain whether he would have kept that promise or not. I like to think that he would have. The weekend slipped by like a fish in oil. I stood in my locker after lunch Monday, searching for my math book. My face flushed when I felt two firm fingers pressure on my shoulder blade. You'll never guess what I saw, Naomi whispered, as if she'd seen in the King Tut's tomb. I stood turning towards her. Her eyes were soft but sly. She was hell on wheels, but she made my heart sing. What? Don't leave me in suspense. She nodded towards the block of lockers where the obnoxious teen boys would often mill about and said, See that locker over there? There's something in it. A playboy. I was a sheltered child. She, she said the word playboy with a drama that didn't land for me. What's that? She took my hand as we crept down the hall. It was beginning to empty out as stir-crazy kids piled into the worn jungle gyms and swings outside. It's a magazine? with naked ladies. My jaw dropped. Seriously? I think I can get it for us, she said with a grin. The concept of something so scandalous, in private, in my young mind being proudly on display along with my still emerging sexuality, made it an offer too tempting to pass up. We found the locker in question, and she held a callous hand up to her ear as she worked the cheap blue lock. Naomi was an artist, and... Her medium was mischief. When the padlock popped open with ease, she handed it to me. You do the honors. No snooping. We just want a magazine. Naomi had a strange sense of morals about such things. Thievery was fair game, but only in moderation. Nothing more than we came for. She would have made a wonderful Robin Hood. I pulled open the locker and my heart froze in my chest. It was empty. Save for a large white hair, twitching on the metal floor, its head bent sideways, and dark, frothy blood dribbling out of its nose and mouth, pooling onto the floor. Bile rose in my throat as a jarring noise grew around me, from everywhere and nowhere. The dying squeals of a rabbit were something I should have considered myself lucky not to have heard before then. The cry felt like a child's. One that was screaming for their life. 
Before I knew what was happening, I felt the lockers on the opposite side of the hall against my back. I tumbled to the floor as a wave of nausea and dizziness washed over me. Pandora? Are you okay? Naomi helped me to my feet and steadied me. I pointed at the locker, blubbering something about rabbits. She looked. And then so did I. It was gone. I wondered if it was ever there in the first place. I rubbed my eyes as Naomi nabbed the dirty magazine. I haven't slept very well lately, I muttered. Bad dreams. She smiled and put a hand on my shoulder. That's what rabbits do, don't they? They disappear. I laughed. Then she laughed. Then we laughed so hard I forgot what we were laughing about. She pulled me into the bathroom, and we flipped through the pages of nude women in erotic poses as we huddled in the last stall on the right. When the bell rang, she pressed a soft kiss to my mouth and asked, Do you want to keep it? I stared at the outstretched magazine. The offer was tempting, yet so dangerous. Live a little, she joked in response to my hesitant expression. Open the box, Pandora. Okay, I finally relented. Wait one second. She took out her favorite purple sharpie, one she always kept on her. I watched her scribble at the very last page, right across the chest of a woman in a barely there bathing suit. It was an address and a phone number. As soon as I got home, I wrote it down in my journal. Had I not done that, Naomi likely would have been a middle school love, lost to the endless march of time and life. But that fate was instead replaced with a stream of letters lasted well into my teens, loving at first, but then only mutually friendly. I squirreled the Playboy away under my bed, tucking it so it lay parallel with the frame. There, I assumed it was safe. I dare not bring it out again unless I was sure I was alone in the deadest of autumn nights. Another week trickled by. The following Monday was calm until we returned home from school. On that day, Jacob had been stopped by our Mastiff Blue in the yard. So much of my mental energy spent on reflecting of what-ifs, wondering what would have happened had Jacob followed me like usual is one of the most prevalent. The wind whipped dry red leaves around the front yard as I stared out the window in the kitchen. My stomach growled and I moved to fix myself a sandwich, wondering why my aunt had not yet accosted us for chores or homework. Behind me, I heard the quiet yet anxiety-inducing clacking of her shoes as she entered the room. I sat down the knife that I had been holding, and for far too long, it was absolutely silent. Then, under her breath, I heard the words, too many chances, and the devil in my house. I turned towards her and was knocked off balance by the backside of her hand, crashing into my face. Her voice was full of cold fury. Do you want to tell me what this thing is, you wretched little thing? I whimpered as she knocked me to the hard kitchen floor. I knew exactly what it was. It was the goddamn Playboy. I thought I'd hidden it well enough. I was wrong. Sinful little harpy, with your book full of whores! She snatched up my hair and started dragging me out through the doorway and towards the stairs, and I thrashed desperately. Disgusting little freak. I've tolerated this long enough. I've allowed Satan to take up residence in my house, and I will not have it any longer. Your sin will not go unpunished. Her voice popped and cracked with an unspeakable rage. Less curt than it had been before. My fingernails raked at the stairs, and anything else I might be able to gain purchase on as my head thumped against each solid wooden step. My nose hit the wall at one point and exploded with blood. I tasted dust and copper. By the time we were on the second floor, I was too dizzy to scream for help. She dragged me into the bathroom and slammed the door, locking it. You will both have to stand before the Lord and be judged. I will make sure of it. He'll throw your wretched, miserable souls into the great inferno. I wailed as she began to fill the tub with water. Urgent footsteps pounded against the kitchen downstairs, though I couldn't decipher their owner. Pulling myself up, I tried to throw myself towards the door. She caught me by the neck. Please, I begged. Please don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She spat in my face. 
You're lucky. Maybe this water will purge you before you stand before God Almighty, she whispered as she plunged my head underneath the icy water. And my world went blurry. My body burst into uncontrollable shivers as I flailed desperately. I'd feel my lungs filled with cold water and my aunt held her grip. But she slammed my face against the porcelain bottom of the bathtub. Crimson bloomed out into the water. For a moment, I thought of death. I wondered whether fire and brimstone truly would be waiting for me on the other side. Then I heard the screaming. The clatter of metal on metal, the breaking of glass, the barking of a dog. Behind all that, I could hear another sound in my delirious brain, one that I couldn't recognize. My aunt released me and stood up, storming out of the bathroom door with a slew of curses. I threw myself from the tub, throwing up mouthfuls of frigid water before gulping in as much air as I could. I struggled onto weak legs and ran for my life. I rammed my shoulder into the back door and tumbled ass over elbows down the back steps. I could hear the cacophony of noises that had freed me from my watery grave better now. Jacob had heard my desperate struggle. That was why he was running around the front yard, shouting blasphemies and obscenities and banging our only two pots together. My aunt was chasing him with a knife. Behind that, there was an ever-present cloud of cawing. The swarm of carrion birds blotted out the sun. I spilled out into the barn out back and slammed the big wooden door shut behind me, pushing some dust-coated farm equipment in front of the door. When the bang started at the door, I climbed into the loft and picked the corner with the least amount of spiderwebs. I shivered there for hours, blood drying on my face as my mind created shapes in the dark. I watched figures made out of shadow dig their claws into the sides of the loft and pull themselves up, ready to devour me. I could feel whispers of their fingers on my face. I didn't leave the barn until slivers of moonlight peeked into the rotting wood slats. My clothes were still damp as I trudged over to one of my only friends in this damn place. My breath came out in frigid clouds as I focused on drawing in air, in and out. She tried to drown me. She tried to kill me. I was going to die. I collapsed against Frith's sturdy wooden support. And I began to sob. I can't go back inside. She'll do it again. She'll do it again. I'm going to freeze out here. As I curled my knees into my chest and wailed in earnest, I felt something on my back. A thin scraping like the comforting touch of a mother, but in all the wrong ways. In my periphery I saw it, the end of a gnarled branch curled into knotted fingers. I couldn't move. The wind whistled around in the stalks of corn and it almost sounded like whispers. I launched up off the ground and ran around the back of the house. Jacob sat there beside the crawl space door, where he'd no doubt been hiding. He looked up at me with a swollen black eye. Blood was caked onto his deep frown, and his nose bent just a little too far to the right. A long slash ran across his chin and jawline, a battle scar from saving my life. Guilt seized me for not coming to his aid at that moment, and I felt like a coward. She's gone insane. Dad isn't in his room. I think... She might have killed him. She hadn't murdered our father, of course. He'd gone into town that day to look for work. He wanted to turn our lives around. But his children suffering from the hands of an aunt with a murderous rage, there was little else that we can come up with. I didn't tell Jacob about the scarecrow, but it had touched my back with its crackly tree hands. Too much was going on. Though I knew he would believe me, there was only so much a mind like his could stand. We snuck back into the house, Jacob pulling me along and whispering reassurances as we climbed the stairs. Our feet as close to the wall as possible to avoid making the old wood creak. 
I could only breathe easy once we were in our room, and the door was locked. It was a small barrier between us and the madwoman that now wanted our blood spilled, but it was a barrier nonetheless. We have to run away. Dad can't save us now. Jacob was shoving things into a bag. I was... I was still so tired. So very cold. I stripped out of my damp sweater, desperate for dry warmth. Morning. Can't we wait until the morning? I whispered. Jacob looked my way as I curled into the fetal position under my meager white blanket. His expression was heavy with a fight between fear and concern. Okay. Morning. But then we have to go. I rub my eyes hard. We'll sleep in shifts. He paused, before nodding quietly. Jacob coaxed me out of bed and helped me into dry clothes, keeping his eyes on the door as often as he could. My brother. My protector. You'd better wake me up, I mumbled as my eyes grew too heavy to stay open. He didn't respond, instead merely throwing his blanket over me and causing a deep shiver to rack me, the kind you get when the warmth is finally returning to your body. I knew he would end up letting me sleep. My dreams are plagued with dark visions, twisting animalistic bodies, dipping in and out of the shadows as I could hear the cries for help from my brother somewhere in the distance, accompanied by wails of a discordant calliope. I shot upright in bed, sometimes in the early hours of the morning. Jacob lay against my bed. His breathing deepened in light sleep. Behind it, I could hear an odd sound. The creaking of the front door on its hinges, no doubt pushed by the wind. I slowly got to my feet and I slid them across the wooden floor to the door. Against my better judgment, I, I disengaged our bedroom lock and slowly pushed the door open. The house was icy and my shivers returned in full force. I coughed quietly into my hand as I came to the top of the stairs. As my bare feet descended the wood steps as quietly as possible, I found myself reciting a prayer that I'd heard whispered by my grandmother above my mother's pale body. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I could hear the thumps in the living room. It sounded like movement of some sort of wild animal. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb. The air smelled sour like rotting plants and urine. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Terror seized my lungs, making it hard to breathe as I neared the bottom. And at the hour of our death, I reached the bottom step and peeked into the living room. Holding my aunt above the floor as her pink slippered feet swung frantically was... Its long, knotted branches hovered just in front of her face, and my aunt's skin looked paper white in the glow of the TV. How the scarecrow kept upright in its single support post, I couldn't tell you. The physics bent to the will of whatever this thing truly was. The burlap was pulled tight around whatever lay beneath it, and yellow eyes with wide black pupils bulged out of the rips. Swaths of rough brown fabric hung from the mouth and cheeks, revealing a mouth filled to nearly bursting with white, dinosauric teeth. Before I could so much as blink, the scarecrow sunk its makeshift claws into her neck. A fountain of blood erupted from her mouth, and then everywhere else as it dragged its impossibly sharp digits through her neck like a sword through hot butter. Her headless body made a wet thwump as it hit the ground. A soft whimper escaped her mouth, and the hare's head snapped to look at me. If she deserved it, make no mistake. But in the moment, I felt no sense of satisfaction. All I felt was insurmountable fear. I shrieked as I flew up the stairs. I could hear Jacob jump to his feet, and my body crashed into his as I flung myself into our room. Go! Now! We didn't have time to make it out the window. As the door opened, I flung Jacob towards my bed, and we scrambled underneath. We both heard the steady thumps as the monster I'd formerly known as Frith crept into our room. Pandora? Pandora, what is that? Jacob's voice was quiet and urgent, and I pressed his face into my chest. 
Nothing, Jacob. Just keep your eyes closed. Don't you look, okay? He protected me. No, I was doing the same. It stood over my bed, staring down into my eyes with its wide, soulless ones as I held Jacob close to me. That was all I knew until the sun began to creep over the cornfields. Its eyes and mine. I didn't know whether or not it intended for me to meet the same fate as my aunt. As dawn ran its fingers through the hills and forests of Tennessee, the scarecrow broke our staring contest. As soon as it began to move, I squeezed my eyes shut tight. It leaned down, and with a wooden claw, it stroked my right cheek. A thin trickle of blood ran its way down my cheek. But still, I remained frozen. It withdrew, and I heard the slow thumps as he retreated down the stairs and out the front door. I still have that scar. Despite the sun spilling into the room from the window, we didn't move from our spot under the bed. The terror and innocence both left my body in one great outpouring as the exhaustion of someone that witnessed a murder took hold. I pulled Jacob closer as my eyes slipped closed. The sound of a scream woke me up. It was the voice of a man, one I hadn't heard in so long. He was our father, our real father, not the ghost that had been long wandering the rough oaken floors of the farmhouse when we'd long since fallen into our beds. And before Jacob and I could fully get out from under the bed, he'd flown up the stairs and thrown open our door. His face was flushed, and his eyes were full of a vibrant sort of terror. The kind only a father who sees dark blood stains on the floor all the way to the back door and his sister and children nowhere to be found could feel. He was alive again. Grief stamped out like a dying fire pit by fresh fear. Kids, are you okay? I hated seeing him so worried. But running into his outstretched arms felt like... Like rising from the grave. Things moved extremely fast after that. Police were called. The farmhouse was coroned off with yellow tape that whipped in the late November wind. The cornfield where one scarecrow had gone AWOL was stripped bare. We found a temporary home in a shitty little inn in Main Street. The sanctioned search for my aunt didn't last long. On the third day, everyone went to sleep, and when they brought their trucks back and assembled their grids... They made a grisly discovery. My father refused to tell me what had been found until I was much older. Sitting on top of the pole where Frith had once been was my aunt's severed head, her milky eyes still filled with a cosmic sort of horror, like she'd seen the very devil she preached so adamantly about. Laid out in the ground in front of it was a blood-soaked Bible. The same Bible that my aunt had made us read innumerable times. Every single line of text in the entire book was indecipherable except for one verse. So they continued asking him. He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Shortly after that, we were packing things away and into boxes and loading them into our father's truck. After some slight pressing, my brother admitted to our father what our aunt had done to us. There were many emotions, and all of them crowded over one another for center stage. Despair at losing his sister, I mean, really, losing her in a way that death can't hold a candle to. Guilt for not seeing the bruises on Jacob or the unspoken pleas in our eyes on the rare occasions that he'd leave his room. Sadness that the love of his life was not there to advise him where to go next or what to do now. But the greatest of these was rage. A boiling fury at the attempted murder of his children at the hands of someone he trusted. That anger has never fully gone away. We left town two days after the funeral. To this day, Frith's motives are still unclear to me. It's possible the Scarecrow was some sort of an orthodox protector. I'd been an only friend to it, and it was returning the favor. Maybe it was never something to be feared. 
But sometimes I find myself looking up places that I've been in early hours in the morning and Google takes me to that little village. Each time I see the slowly increasing amount of missing persons reports, it's hard not to feel that Frith was a hair of a darker color. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It's winter, I think. I don't know exactly how the seasons work or on what day it changes, but it's damn cold. And you know what's good when it's cold? Tea. Hot tea. And my wife sells hot tea at Ivory Monocle. Ivory Monocle has a whole bunch of different kinds of loose leaf tea, including creepy pasta themed loose leaf tea, or I guess Christmas and holiday themed loose leaf tea because tis the season. And you can get that right now at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my contributors on Patreon. You guys are the real MVP. You guys keep the lights on here. And a very special thank you to all of the big skeleton patrons, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Mask Note, Rashad Collins, Joshua Mullen, Zavium, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Ben Spates, Anna Storm, Jeremy H, Raltazol, Nana, The Morgan, Diamondella, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, I Soda Hatred, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Michael Scarborough, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Patreon, and for everybody who's down there in the description, and everybody who even contributes just one dollar to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And, as always, my friends, sweet dreams. <laughs>